That's very cool. It's, it's just you would have thought it's solved in B2C. So in any moment, you can go, Google a watch, Google a T-shirt, you can Google a car, you can do all of mm. this in, in a fraction of a fraction of a second. But goodness only knows what olive oil is, or sunflower oil in this case, is supposed to cost you in mm. Joburg as a restaurateur. Nobody knows. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. Mm. Welcome, builders, to How Would You Build It? The podcast that dives deep into the dynamic world of startups and product creation right here in South Africa and Africa. This show is more than just interviews. Every week, we sit down with the brilliant minds to provide a masterclass for building digital products amidst the challenges and opportunities unique to our continent. From seasoned founders to dynamic product managers, we uncover the unique stories and strategies behind some of the most innovative digital products being built. So for all the aspiring founders and product builders out there, you'll discover that each episode is a wealth of practical wisdom and local and actionable insights. Make sure to subscribe or follow wherever you listen to our podcasts and connect with us on social media for even more content. Now, let's dive into today's episode. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of How Would You Build It? It's episode 75, rolling it on. I'm happy to be back. Renee, how are you doing? Sorry for letting you down last week. How are you doing this week? No. All good, Bobby. Good to be here. Cool. Welcome. And then lastly, um, Sven, the co-founder or Hi, founder guys. of Heads Up. It's nice to have you. How are you doing? Co-founder. Well? co-founder. I'm doing very well. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Would never have been able to do it on my own. So no, I'm happy co-founder. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, we can actually dive into that because that's exactly okay. the kind of things that we like talking about on the podcast mm. is, you mm. know, how do you go, how do you do that zero to zero to one? And uh, yeah, having a co-founder mm. is obviously one of those um not even a secret, but things that one, mm. one would want to do mm. in starting a business. But, but before mm. we uh, go off on tangents, can you just tell us what mm. is Heads Up? What do you guys do? Well, Heads Up, um, Heads Up is a system where we provide information and insights to participants in the food service industry about the purchases that they put into their business. Um, so what that means, if I can illustrate that with an example. So uh, Bobby, where are you based? Cape Town? Mm-hmm. Stellenbosch? Cape Town. No, so did you, did you know that there is no way for a restaurant in Cape Town to know what frying oil is supposed to cost them? It's just wow. not Googleable. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so essentially, if you ask what Heads Up is, Heads Up is a system where we find that information, we structure it, um, and we publish that information um, and increasingly act on that information um, automatically. Yeah. So yeah, we okay. find, structure, and publish that information and act on it. Where we can and specifically um, for the restaurant industry the food specifically industry. for for food service yeah so that covers restaurants coffee shops and catering um we exclude fast food and takeaways um and that's not so much because i want to exclude it it's just they are actually well they sound very similar they're exceptionally distinct supply chain businesses so mm. so mm. there are a lot of difficulties running a what's called a qsr or a quick service restaurant it's a very difficult thing to run but it doesn't have a lot of inputs and so you know you have one set of of um chopped up lettuce you know and that's all that they use in the whole restaurant poof that's it you know you've got one bun and everything gets made out of one bun so from a procurement point of view it's a it's a different thing to a standalone restaurant that that carries somewhere between you know 400 and 800 items in the in the good sure. yeah you know, and so that's why we exclude the the fast food yeah, yeah. Mm. but that's the that's the secret of the restaurants right mm. you want to minimize as much input as possible <laughs> you want to bring in as few items fresh goods <laughs> and you want to output you want to turn them into a, an end product as quickly as much as possible right no wastage <laughs> you want to cap yeah. those margins as it, much as possible uh yeah you, you, yeah um the wastage on fresh um, so it depends on the type of restaurant. You know, you've got, you've got high-end restaurants, um, and high-end restaurants are a lot less price elastic and cost sensitive because um, they really make their money off what they sell it for. So you've got a little plate of pom puree for 400 rand or whatever that is essentially just one potato. So they don't particularly care what that potato costs. You know, depending on who mm. the, the restaurant is, they, they will have a bigger and bigger focus on, on the input cost. Broadly speaking, if you take the entire sector as a whole you can work on someone at 30 or 35 percent of the 100 rand that they're charging you about 30 or 35 rands is is the inputs of various kinds mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. wastage from perishability is one wastage can you know there's a there's a stock carrying component 
very practical things like if you have a restaurant that's X big, uh, you want to maximize the number of seats that you've got because that's what you're trying to do. So the back mm. is very small. You know, there isn't a lot of space to put stuff. They don't have massive coolers mm. and 50 days mm. worth of stock because you'd rather mm. have a table with two seats in that exact space. So it's a lot of dynamics that go into into yeah. carrying stock, wastage, and so on. But yeah, mm. um, there's so, very little ability for them to to get purchasing perspective or to get information on what the market is for a particular input, prying oil, peppercorns, anything. Mm. Yeah. So Sen, maybe let's mm. get a bit practical. Like, how, how does it mm. work? Like, uh, I've got a restaurant, say, in Stellenbosch, and um, yeah. you know, I use I use your product. Like, what does it do for me? So what it does for you is we take in everything that you have purchased. We've got a few ways of doing that. You will be surprised at how analog uh, restaurants still are. Um, in fact, the business started uh, because I, I, my sister was a it's GM for a couple of restaurants and small group of restaurants. And one day I was just visiting and there was this photocopier box, you know, next to her desk. And there's all this paper in it. I thought it was a waste bin, you know, but that was actually the filing location for all the invoices was in this old photocopier paper box. Um, so, so it's very analog. Uh, so how somebody would use a system if they're on analog, they take a picture of uh, an invoice, WhatsApp it into us, and our server takes it from there. If you're already digital in some way, you can copy us, our server in on an email, or if you are already fully digitized, we can log into wherever you've got, wherever your repository is, and go fetch, go fetch mm -hmm. the information on your behalf. So we'll pretty much ingest, <laughs> excuse the pun, uh, everything you purchased for the month, and then um, our system will will provide a, an index and a position for how you did purchasing wise. So let's take that example of potatoes that I was talking about. So you purchased potatoes for 10 Rand a kilo, and then you would get a, a report and visibility going, other people purchased potatoes for as little as 4 Rand and as little as much as 16 Rand. And you'd essentially get a listing of what the market around you is mm. for potatoes. So if you wanted to swap out your potato supplier for whatever reason or your potatoes for whatever reason, you'd be able to see that. And we, we give a handy um, kind of back of the cigarette box, but also a very AI accurate calculation of, of how much you've been overcharged, essentially. Um, and we tend and, to find and this that... this data is live? Can, can a person see this data live? Like, literally, I'm yeah, getting so, potatoes so, at this price. And, yeah, yeah so, so my ambition is to have it live for users. I can see it live. Obviously, internally, we can see it live. So I, I know that right now. But internally, I can see it. But for clients, we tend to release it once a month. Um, that's okay. just, we want to be a hundred gazillion percent sure that there are actually potatoes for four and a kilo before we uh, spread it across industry and, and create trouble. Yeah. So, so the ambition is for it to be completely live one day. I think we have the infrastructure to do it. Um, we haven't really found too many errors in AI's work just yet, but I just want to be sure. So yeah, it would give you this, so Renew, it would give you this insight into into how you are doing and how your mm. ingredient procurement is stacking up against the industry and, and whether your suppliers are taking care of you or not. And then it gives mm. you one or two and you, tools that you can use if they're not doing so. And and when did you start this business then? And, and what has the traction been like up until now? Uh, started, yes, start is also a malleable term, but officially started about two and a half years ago with us conceptually started say three years ago um we spent the first year or so developing iterating trying um our recent traction has been very good we really our product is robust really assuming some robustness and we're getting quite a bit of traction in terms of we had 600 700 percent growth in the last year you know um wow. there's a small base effect obviously but the, the you mm. know we were we were iterating and tinkering and really the, the market's starting to respond to what we're doing. So, um, especially mm. on enterprise. Now we've got two products. Awesome. The, the one is for core. So it's for a single site or possibly you want five sites. And then there's an enterprise product as well, where we have, have bigger chains and bigger groups where we can give them really cool perspective across what they're doing across their business or kind of what it's, what their business is doing to them <laughs> more than what they're doing mm. across their business. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and how much, what is the kind of saving that people get when they use the product? Like, I mean, 
if they, if they save like marginal small mar- you know small amounts it doesn't move the needle that much but what what are some of the things you've seen like how much money do people end up saving because of this so the way i like to um tell people about it is that you can double your profit um and mm. the reason for that is that restaurants tend to be low margin operations so in the aggregate a restaurant is making 5% or so if they're lucky um, and we are finding that people, we can identify 10 to 20% savings of which they can actually wrap, easily wrap their arms around 5 to 10% of that. So sure. if you want to think about it is, is, although it sounds like food cost, as we were saying, is about a third of, third of the mm-hmm. 100 rand that you're getting charged as a consumer. If we can save and find six off that, you know, that goes straight mm-hmm. to the bottom line. It doesn't go mm-hmm. anywhere else. Um, it's, so, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating business though Sven, because if everybody uses your product then eventually no one, no, one, no one would use your product <laughs> well um, <laughs> yeah I know so, so, so I, I know uh, I mean no one uh, will hmm. we'll never get to a point where everybody there shouldn't be it. an I mean, inefficiency no... so, yeah, so from yeah, what yeah. I'm describing the perfect use of the product should eliminate all of the inefficiency and therefore yes. there should be you know, recursively there should be no need to use the product yeah. Um, so what we are, and that for, won't, and that won't happen because there's no product well, in the world that everybody uses. Yeah. F- first of all, but you know, let's say, um, dear investors, we're definitely going to get a hundred percent market share adoption. <laughs> you know, uh, but the, the the industry um, is very fragmented. Uh, the 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 product line um, universe is very fragmented. We're tracking seventy thousand products across 1,900 categories, eh? 1,900 categories of products. Sure, so that's when you sure. go peppercorns or dishcloths or, you know, cabbage. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a category. Um, there's 1,900 of those. Restaurants are exceptionally complex businesses. They look quite simple from the outside, but they're mm-hmm. very complex to run. And mm-hmm. because of that fragmentation and call it not noise, but activity um, inside of things that are always moving around, suppliers are moving around, mm. markets are moving around. We don't think that it'll be possible to eliminate all of the inefficiency, but what we are hoping to achieve is to reduce the distribution of outcomes. So there are very fat tails at the moment of, of, profit, of people getting taken advantage of and people buying well, and we're hoping that that becomes nice and thin and narrow. Mm. You know, we have more conversation with clients to justify what we charge, whereas at the moment it's not something that comes mm. up. Yeah. In fact, investors tell keep me, telling us to charge more. So. Oh, really? Mm. And mm. tell me um, about how the suppliers are, are adopting your product uh, or the business as such. Like, How yeah. do they feel about you know, becoming this transparent with their pricing? They are not involved in becoming transparent um, about their pricing. So um, we have made a okay. structural decision. So if you think of it's a where can I get the information that I'm talking about? So naturally mm-hmm. you'd say, okay, cool. You're going to go to the big five suppliers and you kind of convince one of them and then you list all of their, you know, all of their excuse and then, you know, build a, build a kind of market or platform like that. We completely ignored the suppliers in the process. So we don't receive any information from suppliers. We have no integrations with suppliers. Um, you know, we haven't talked to most of it. We're tracking got 2,100 suppliers on the system, eh? of which 1,500 are active more or less in South Africa at one time. You, you will be staggered to find out how many small businesses there are in this ecosystem. So that's, you know, Bobby's Avocados or Renew's Calamari or whatever it is. Um, there's a lot of those. Um, but we build this data directly from client information. So we, if you think of we are looking at, 10 different invoices, they have 10 different suppliers from 10 different types of sirloin, then we will be able to build an anonymized listing um, out of that and give you perspective on it. So we are not involved with suppliers at all. So they, some of them have have gotten a little upset and um, I'm hoping to get sued one day. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Haven't heard that before. Oh, it'll 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 tell us that we've got our finger in the in the right place and we're turning it mm. nice and hard. You know, that's basically what that'll say. Is is um, but the suppliers are it's not up to them. Um, mm. This is client. I've never I've never heard of that as a success criteria. We'll, we'll put that on the on the whiteboard mm. and <laughs> mm. keep it for future. I'm hoping to get sued, and then we shall not spend any time on lawyers and so on who are very expensive. Then I will be taking our billboards 
than Facebook posts going, Bobby's supplier is suing us. Guess why? You know, <laughs> will be the best marketing we ever got. So that's why I'm <laughs> facetiously saying I'm hoping to get sued. I mean, that it'll be a it'll be a big indication to the market that we're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, it's an interesting criteria to look at, mm. and I guess it makes Very sense when you're disrupting an industry. Yeah. Yeah, so what happened two and a half years ago was, as I said, I, was, I had sold my stake in my previous business and um, I had a lot of bandwidth available. I was visiting my sister and I literally saw this empty photocopier box with papers in it. She said, oh, those are, that's the, you know, we just chuck the invoices in there and then, the, you know, the accountant takes it from there. I thought to myself, but how do you know what's going on? You know? And so, like, naturally, the OCD part of me just wanted to kind of unpack that box and put it into neat little piles and go, here's a supply one pile, this is a supply two pile, that's a supply three pile, and just organize those piles. And we went through that box and put it into piles. And then you, the first product was really a notification service going, hey, Renee, did you see last week you paid a hundred bucks for your bacon, whatever. Um, this week it's 105 because that stuff just gets thrown in that box. You would have noticed it more like a notification service. And then, and then it grew, grew from there. Yeah. Oh, he says that it started as a notification on, on, on informing yeah. the restaurants on yeah, the on pricing. Tracking, okay, that's cool. tracking, yeah, because frequently you've got a restaurant or an owner of a restaurant or a manager of a restaurant. The other dynamic in terms of management of these uh, businesses is multi-shift. So although possibly Bobby was on shift one, he wasn't on shift two. Something happened on shift two. Bobby didn't see it. There's a gazillion things for you to do. The last thing you've got to do is paperwork and quite a lot of stuff only gets noticed 30 days later or three months later. You know, in the meantime, you've mm. paid an extra 30K on some inputs of some kind. Um, yeah, and so it started out as a, you know, what we can do, we can put this into metaphorical piles and go through them and let you know if there's something you need to notice. And then, yeah, and then we grew from there. Then we kind of figured out that we had all of these piles all over the place and then kind of figured out that we could go, oh, well, you know, we could create listings, you know, essentially. Out mm. of the pile, so. Mm. Yeah. So, so, so now, how did you get your first customer? Was it someone in your network, or did you, did you actually <laughs> take it? So, so you see the same sister that I spoke about with that box. Um, so, my very first customer was was a nepotistic. Nepotist was it was acquired by nepotistic pressure. Yeah. So, um, okay. technically, she was my first customer, but no, we we I got the, the first set of data from there, and then. Um, the first customers after that, the first real customers acquired through networks, people that I, I knew from the industry and so on. And we got our first kind of five running and then um, um, developed the tech from there and tried to get to a value proposition that was communicable. And um, as I said, mm. then you really started focusing on that very hard in the last year or so, the go-to-market side of it. Before that, there was a lot of development and a lot of um, figuring out what the what that product market fit click sounded like. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and how did you go yeah. about your pricing? I mean, did you was there uh, a specific strategy start, around I, figuring I, it out, or was it kind of like no, you know, let's, no, let's I, pick I, a no. We 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 picked a number. Um, I picked a number. It might sound random, but I I, I picked four hundred and ninety nine rands, and then um, I didn't hear anybody squeal, and then we just started putting it up until the very first people started saying, sure, that sounds like a bit much. And that's mm. pretty much how we, how we figured it out. I, I had a what is the 499 a monthly? A monthly, so it's now 2499, two, two and a half thousand rands a month. Um, contextually, the aggregate client is buying, say, half a million a month of various inputs. And for us to justify two and a half thousand is what, 0.5% of purchases. It's not even of their turnover. You know, of their turnover, it'll be a, th a third of even that. Um, and it's a, mm. from that point of view, it's a, it's a great sale to a client as opposed to some other system because it's very easy to measure the ROI. I either saved you two and a half or I didn't. You know, and it was mm. very apparent. Mm. And so we started at 400 odd rand and then just pushed it up. Yeah. I had a, I had a partner mm. in a previous business who always used to say, if, if you're not hitting it against the net every once in a while, you're not hitting the ball. Um, no. <laughs> you, you're, not, you're, not like hitting it. you're hitting it too high essentially if you don't hit it against yeah. the net every once in a while you're hitting it too high so every once in a while you've got to have a client who goes ah it's mm. too rich for me and then you know your pricing is about right mm. Mm. so I'm interested in like in this space like from a payment perspective you mm. know if you go overseas in America everybody pays with credit cards 
locally people you know mm-hmm. but debit card and, and eft like how, how do you guys collect money is it do you monthly invoice and collect or is it an automated payment solution it's an automated payment solution by credit card yeah um, by credit card so, okay and they, so and they're yeah. fine using it uh in south africa every once in a while i'd say one or two out of ten clients there's a bit of you know there's a bit of groaning um, but mostly they're fine yeah um okay most, mostly they're fine yeah. some good feedback Mm, it's easier. So we, we even though it's a B2B product, um, we try and explain yeah. it to clients from a B2C point of view. So everybody understands an app with a subscription. We just press cancel. Yeah. So we have no, we have got no lock-ins, no hardware. There's nothing tying <laughs> you to the system. You, so you also so don't need a finance tunny. You also don't, don't need a finance tunny to no. email everyone. What what I find interesting is, uh, I mean, have you looked at the competition out there? What's out there as well in the space? I mean, it seems like quite an obvious problem to solve, right? I mean, it does, right? Mm. The, the, but I mean, I worked in the restaurant industry in a in a previous lifetime, and um, uh-huh. yeah, I just yeah, that's why I'm just wondering. Like, it feels like something that someone would have done already by now. Yeah, were you, were you front of house or, or back of house on, in the restaurant? Uh, both. A bit oh, more front okay. of us, front of us. Okay. Let's say front of us. Okay, okay. So, so, so some kind of management or super managing yeah, yeah. ownership. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you would have. That's why I know about the deliveries and all the different people rocking up that you have to check oh, and count and and and, count you know. and and you also know that you took that piece of paper, you probably scribbled on it in some way, and yeah. you put it into a tray somewhere, and immediately yeah, we went had to, to go put to it in a else. file. Immediate, put yeah, it in the file at the end of the month. The files were taken away. Yeah, the files were taken away. That was. That was it. That's the system. You know, that's how it's managed. Um, yeah. So it, it, I, I can, I can get very passionate about the fact that this isn't solved. And, and I was, I had labored under the assumption that this was solved. So when I first encountered that photocopier box with all the paper in it, so that, ah, there's got to be, you know, there's got to be something in the space already. Um, mm-hmm. but there's so much tension. Think of, um, broadly speaking, I, I looked this up last night with stats. They say broadly speaking, Restaurants, coffee shops, and catering is about a hundred billion rand a year of the income for them. Um, of which then there's call it 20 to 25 billion of that is purchases. There's so much focus sure. on, on the, on the, um, hundred billion, meaning there are so many people going for payments and being part of the point of sale and getting something off the front end of that, which is the obvious side. That um, there's nobody, there is nobody looking at the 20 billion end of it, and because then of the mm. fragmentation that I spoke about, so now that 20 billion is split into 70,000 bits across 1,900 categories and so on and so on. It's it's just for some reason there's just no attention getting paid to it. So we're in a we're in a privileged position where we're doing something very difficult. It's exceptionally hard to to create the visibility on what is what in the supply chain. Um, but we have very little competition because it is so difficult mm. and because it's not that obvious. Yeah. So it's very hard and, and, to, in a scaled, automated way, sorry, Rene, um, to figure out, let's say, the feta, you know. So Bobby will have this feta and Rene will be supplying the same feta. And if, if you go try and figure around the Western Cape supplying feta, it could well be the same feta, for argument's sake, a Simon's feta or whatever. But Bobby's calling it super duper feta one and Rene is calling it feta mm. SS. 200G, you know, and now our system needs to be able to work out that both of these are fetters, that both of them to be able to stand, standardize the unit of measure and then also figure out, hold on, these two are the same fetter and then be able to go, oh, okay, well, this price is one and that price is two. And that's quite difficult to do. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's, there's not, there's not as much competition because it's not a sexy problem. Um, it's, just, it's, it's a lot of, yeah, it's not a sexy problem. It's a lot sexier yeah, to go. That's why Jeff Bezos went I'm, for books, right? Amazon went books I'm, I'm because out, it was easy maybe. to categorize. Well, yeah, and, and originally he set out just to do books as well, you know, um, easy to categorize. Um, so I think it's just sexier to say, listen, I'm in a fintech and we, you know, we process a hundred billion rand a year of this. Now, so we're, we're processing, we're tracking a, a billion rands a year of, of GMV um, and still growing. Um, so we're going at a decent clip. Probably about five percent of the economy's kind of purchases in, in non fast food service goods um, and still growing. Sure. But it's just not a sexy industry, and it's difficult to do. And 
there's a lot of opportunity on the front end of, of that 100 billion. Mm. It's not actually 100 billion, so, so it's 93, but for conversation, we can just talk in these. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, Sven, what is the what is the competition now? Uh, I mean, we we obviously there's no other app doing that, but but I mean, what are people doing at the moment when they want to find this information? Do they WhatsApp their mates? Do they yeah, try and check yeah. what it costs at a spa or what do they do? Yeah, yeah. So, so one of my kind of grounding philosophies that that, that we that I work on and that we work on is is the jobs to be done framework. So that's Clayton Christensen mm. and, and jobs to be done. I, I really believe unshakably in that as a framework for understanding it. And what's cool about your question is that inside of that framework, he speaks a lot about getting people to fire their current solution before they hire your current mm. solution. You know, um, mm. you say, well, what are people currently doing? So currently it's Excel spreadsheets. And if you wanted to figure out, I don't know what feta costs, you'd probably phone one or two suppliers that you know from industry. So you know one or two people. You might phone one or two mates. Mm. You get four or five data points. You try and go, oh, well, FET is supposed to be 100. So it's about 100. You know, yeah. okay, cool. This is fine. And then you carry and, on. And no one, no one has time for that. Well, they, they don't really, people, they, they believe they do it more regularly than they actually do it when you measure it. Yeah. Because remember, our clients, um, our clients are, fantastic managers of the most urgent things that are happening in their in their locations mm. so what i've just described to you takes time you know and it takes and you now got to go through line by line for each thing long before bobby you know you were the manager long before you finished phoning around about fit something else is on fire probably literally mm, in no, the restaurant yeah. you know something has literally caught fire and you know or a client mm. or this or that and you've left the desk and you've gone to sort it out yeah. um so it takes mm. it yeah. takes it takes time, you know, and it's not yeah, and it, necessary anymore. That's the thing is it used to be necessary. There was a book, you find your, your you know, your grandfather mm. phoned around and that's how you did it. You took the yellow pages, you phoned around, but it's mm. not necessary anymore. Yeah. But what's super interesting about the restaurant industry mm. is the, the seasonality mm. and the, the mm. spikes in, in, in these mm. things. So, I mean, you mm. keep using avocados. I remember having to run around yeah. for avocados. It yeah. doesn't matter how much it costs. It's on the menu. I need an avocado and I need it now. <laughs> yes, correct. So, yeah. And seasonality, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so how do you, so how do you, how do you manage that? Yeah. Remember, we're not trying to manage seasonality and we're not trying to produce a baseline for clients. What we're trying to say is that we can let you know, let's say uh, Bobby in his restaurant and he paid a hundred rand a box last week or last month. And this week it's 150. So then the other thing that you want to be able to do is for Bobby to be able to see, okay, everybody's gone to 150 for whatever the reason is, you know, it's not just Bobby that's gone to 150. Everybody else is still at a hundred. So when there's a seasonal factor, then that seasonal factor will affect the entire supply chain for that um, item. And we will see the, the market move. Mm-hmm. So essentially the market will move and you'll be able to see relative to the market movement, I still feel that I'm in a fair position or not. Yeah, That's very cool. Because I mean, even mm-hmm. like, was it last year or this year when, when we had that egg shortage? I can only eggs, imagine yeah. how the yeah, bakery yeah. and the yeah. Eggs, yeah, yeah, it must have been an interesting this, data point. You know, there's continuously, remember, I've got these 70,000 items or 1,900 categories. I promise you there is always a, a disaster or there's chaos in one of them somewhere all the time. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> um, it's probably not just quite that public. So as soon as there's a retail aspect to it, like avos or eggs or whatever, then, then people become quite aware of it. But there's always a crunch or a shortage or some inflation or spike or a, or a boat that didn't arrive or a hailstorm or something. You know, affecting an input. Fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'd like to dive into some of your previous experiences. If I do a quick scan, Ooh. I can see that you you mentioned that you've had multiple businesses before, and you said that becoming a co-founder is the way to go because you can't do it alone; you'll go mad. Oh, can you just yeah. tell us some of your your lessons of of starting the business and 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 uh, like you know this buying and selling. Just give us a quick summary of of that experience before you started head uh, heads up. Yeah, sure. So I was, I was, um, the, the, the bulk of my career I spent also in the food business, um, in the food service business, mainly on okay. the agriculture and secondary agriculture side. I, I joined a business that uh, my partner started, which was berry farming at that time. And, um, okay. I was part of a group and a team of people that 
eventually built a vertically, fully vertically integrated supply chain business that went all the way from okay. genetics. So there's a, there's a the thread in your career. Product. Yeah, but I, remember I was only one of the people involved there. And the reason I, I say that what that taught me there was there's absolutely no way that I would have been able to do anything like that on my own. I, I had my piece of it, um, but you know there were partners um, involved in each of the um, aspects of the supply chain, and, and sometimes I wasn't even you know involved in parts of it, um, just because other people were better and stronger at it. And I'm an enormous believer in partnership, enormous believer in partnership. So in the heads up business, I've got a partner, Chad Stein. And he um, covers all of the all of the technical aspects for us. I worked with him for a long time in this secondary agriculture business where he helped us develop systems and ELP systems. So I worked with him for a good 10, 15 years. And then he was also involved um, in food in, in another, in a different business. It was also a kind of restaurant orientated business. And then we'd always stayed in touch. And when this opportunity came along, we, we connected. And um, I'm happy to say that I'm only a co-founder. Um, and what you're looking for, in my opinion, is, is you're looking for a scenario where if your partner or partners leave, that you don't say to yourself, well, let's say, let's say we're 50-50, you know, and my partner leaves. I want to be in a situation where you don't have 50% of a business left. You've got no business left, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And although that sounds like a vulnerability, I think that that's the point of strength where you're going Somebody else is adding mm. so much. Right? You need to be very good Sorry. at stakeholder management if that's the if that's the situation that you're in. And so, it's, is one of my skill sets is 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 stakeholder alignment, um, which I'm good at. But I'm, I believe in having so much value added by partners that it's almost a vulnerability. Mm. So, you you mentioned a technical co-founder, uh, and mm. it actually prompted the, the thought: like, how how much has AI impacted what you do? I'm assuming it's made it a lot yeah. easier, but but maybe speak yeah. a bit about that. Yeah, so I like um, Ben Evans's tongue-in-cheek statement of, of what is AI. You know, AI is software that doesn't work yet. <laughs> um, and, and what I mean by AI, people don't like it when you say that. But, you know, what I mean by that is 10, 15 years ago, you know, it was inconceivable that your phone would be able to recognize your child in, in pictures and automatically organize mm. it. Now it's just a software. Now it's just a feature. You know, I think that... 10, 15 years out from now, the stuff that we find incredible today um, will just be mm. software and will just be a feature on your phone. Um, so we are lucky because the business is only two, two and a half years old from a code base point of view. Um, we have got none of those uh, sunk costs, no legacy issues. We've got no nostalgia towards systems and approaches. And, and we're in that sense, specifically around our data structure um, and what we're doing, AI um, has been front of mind for us. And we're we're, I didn't say that in the beginning because it's such a um, labored hobby horse, but we're definitely an AI-powered business. Quite a bit of what we do is is, is already AI-powered. And, and I think the surface area of where AI will be able to make us efficient and cost-effective is just infinite from here. You know, and I'm mm. really, really excited about the role of AI um, going forward. I, I just don't have enough time in the day to learn and read and implement enough. So that, that, that actually mm. a great segue to my, my question that I want to ask, which um, is, which, mm. what is your first hire? Who has been your first hire? So, you, you know, as this thing is starting to scale now, you need to start mm. delegating. Who was your, what, what position was your first hire? Our first hire was uh, data acquisition management. So the first hire was, I remember I said, let's say you take this box and you receive the, inf the invoices in some way from a client. And then on the very first day, we had no AI, no OCR, no ability to interpret or read or structure or do any of this stuff. That's what we were building. Um, and on the very first day, we had a, we hired a data acquisition manager to assist us with, think of on the first day, you would type it in on an Excel spreadsheet and then you'd roll something out and remove a couple of columns. You'd roll something out and you'd remove a couple of columns and so on. And so, so mm -hmm. data management and data acquisition was is definitely the, we're 15 odd people. It's probably 10 of them. Is it? Mm. Data structure, yeah. data acquisition, data management. Um, absolutely. Yeah. 
Now, as you said, it made uh, like obvious sense that, that you would go with mm -hmm. a data person considering mm -hmm. you're an AR mm -hmm. company. And, and it's actually mm -hmm. quite interesting how data is actually so under underestimated. People like talking about any startup now, not just an AI startup. They just don't yeah. focus on the data and they don't understand the value mm -hmm. that having a data could do for you and your business and, and what you're building. Yeah. And it's no, an afterthought. Sure. It's so frustrating. Oh, yeah. No, it's, listen, um, lucky. Luckily it is because otherwise, you know, we wouldn't be able to be ahead. Um, but, you know, one of the cool things about data or one of the cool, one of the interesting things is to always be thinking about what you, what data you might need to use in the future. So today you only need, you know, data points A, B, and C, but there is a, a 487th data point somewhere, somewhere in it that you could index um, and put into your data set, but you just have no use for it today. But to still build that data lake and then, and then make that again interrogatable um, fast mm. and to be able to then apply machine learning, let's say machine learning instead of AI, machine learning on top of that. Um, you know, I think that's that's a really so people don't mm. know what they're sitting on. We also don't know what we don't know. Um, no. So yeah, so it, yeah, so so the quantity of data and the, the inferences that can be drawn and and in a in a utopia, I have an I have infinite buildings of data scientists and machine learning mm. coders where you can just go. What is the correlation between? the increase in the number of planes landing in Cape Town and the price of baby tomatoes in London or whatever, you know, who knows? Mm. Uh, who knows what, what could be related? <laughs> there is a correlation. Of, the, there might be, well be, yeah. Yeah, yeah there might well be. Um, so, mm. so, so I'd love to just uh, hear from Renier, like, um, you know, you, you, you I always ask because you, you touch so many different startups, you meet so many different people, the newsletter, we touch on so many different industries. What's mm. standing out for you in this one? Because it's a, it's kind of the first time we've had someone in the restaurant sort of, or the food industry on, on the podcast. So just trying to pick your brain to understand where you are seeing the opportunity and, and, and what stands out for you. No, I think price inefficiencies for me is a major opportunity. Um, when Sven and I had a conversation the other day, I was like speaking about how it annoys me in rental property, the inefficiencies mm -hmm. of the market mm -hmm. is crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, Sven, uh, with Heads Up, found you know a place where there's a lot of, um, it's a big industry, and there's a very good reason why people are not hands-on on the prices. So having a tool that can give them the latest prices and just bring, mm -hmm. you know, make price discovery more efficient. Mm -hmm. um, is good for the economy. I'm a free market person at heart. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as soon as value gets pulled out of a system uh, or, you know, without, without adding the mm -hmm. same amount of value, then, you know, it's mm -hmm. not good for the system. Mm -hmm. So, so solutions like this that makes price discovery easier, uh, that brings for fair value uh, to the marketplace, I think is amazing because, not only is Sven building an awesome business, but it's actually helping econ the economy. Like it's literally, mm -hmm. you know, retaining value at the areas where the effort is put in and, and the value mm -hmm. is created, which um, no disrespect to people that um, are distributors, you do add value. <laughs> maybe yeah, maybe so, sometimes yeah. just, may, maybe just, uh, and in some cases, just disproportionate. So solutions like mm -hmm. this help with that. And I, I think it's awesome. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how awesome is it? Uh, I think also, you know, it's 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 a business that was would have been really hard to do ten years ago. Correct. But now, yeah. with the evolution of machine learning and, and artificial mm. intelligence, it's mm. it's it's become easier mm. to actually um, mm. you know do something like this, which I think is awesome because it's a it's it's one of, it's one of many examples of how we can now do things we've never been able to do simply because we mm. have this capability. Spot on. So yeah. it's Spot so on. it's not exist product that just gets mm. ai plugged on it's a mm. it's a, it's literally like a ai business <laughs> it's a business that can't yeah. exist without it yeah. ai enabled yeah it is it's no. AI enabled and ai powered and, and ai first and and all of those presentation slide things and then there's a very <laughs> exciting additional inflection point which is llms and and the evolution of large language models of producing this inflection point um, and, and i really think that that technology businesses like ours and, and everybody else's are at this inflection point where 
where mm. enormous value is going to get unlocked, created and or unlocked. It just wasn't possible before. It's again, and you make the most with the luck you get. So we're lucky to be active and launching at this time. Luckily, we didn't have to raise a hundred billion or whatever to build an LLM. That somebody else has done that for us. Um, mm. But this is, this is the time and uh, we feel particularly lucky to be operating at this time. It feels very birth of the internet kind of era. You know, it feels like mm. late nineties ish, you know, and the LLMs feel to me like it's like you're watching a recent release mosaic, you know, <laughs> it really is. Mm. Um, I, I really think that that's the type of moment where we're at. It's, it's like we've just watched jobs hold up the iPhone. It's, it's one of those moments. Yeah. Mm. Well, mm. it's quite a statement. Mm. Mm. No, no, for sure it is. Yeah. LLMs are going to, LLMs are going to completely create the app economy for sure. Mm. Yeah. But I'm just thinking as you're talking, like, you know, you're focusing on the food industry, restaurant industry, but mm. I think if you mm. fix, I mean, you mentioned it before we clicked record, which is the inefficiencies within mm. supply chains in general, right? Oof, yeah, yeah. And so yeah. you're just touching one industry. You could take these lessons and apply them in multiple industries because there's some serious supply yeah. chain yeah. issues, issues out Absolutely. there. And, and, and technologies. Yeah. And so, and so the, the anecdote I've got for you to, to speak to this passion that I've got about, about, B2B supply chains and these inefficiencies actually also come from my, my prior experience. Um, and, and it's a presentation I did to farmers, if you want to believe it. So some presentation to farmers, it was a marketing commercial, one of some kind. And, um, you know, very impressed with myself, obviously, with the marketing or commercial insights or whatever that I had to share with them. And then there was like a bra and drunkies type of setup afterwards. I'll never forget, I was youngish, you know, late 20s or early 30s or whatever, and, and this, this one uh, farmer came over to me, loved this guy in a two-tone shirt and the, and the proper shorts, two-tone shirt, all this farmer. And he said to me, I'll never forget this heavy Afrikaans accent, very bright guy, heavy Afrikaans accent, says to me, oh, Sveno, because he was just say, hey, Sveno, you oaks keep calling it the value chain. But you must remember, to us farmers, it's just a cost joke. Um, <laughs> and, and just that idea of, you know, when are you adding value and when are you adding costs, you know, and, uh, you know, it's something that we had to permit, obviously, in a, you know, food and food service and food supply chain business. But, but this, the inefficiencies that are the result of a lack of transparency and a lack of visibility, when you, you said you're a, free market guy, but the free market can only operate with sunlight. You know, sunlight's the best disinfectant. Mm. And if you cannot mm. see where else you can buy Nikes or you cannot see where else you can trade in mm. your Corolla or whatever, if you can't see, then the free market will not do its work. And these B2B mm. supply chains, you know, Bobby, you see you're getting me going. How the B2B supply chains are endemic to the fact that the, the information asymmetries are stuck in the, mm. with the um, the, the middlemen or the, or the intermediates in the supply chain. Mm. And those information asymmetries are, are being actively protected and maintained because it's in their interest to do so because you can get asymmetric you know, um, margin benefits from doing so because mm. your clients just don't know when and where and how to move. And whether that's the food supply chain or whether that's construction or whether that's so anything else, there's, without sunlight, you're just not going to allow the free market to do its thing. Um, mm. And that, and it, it gets, it gets me, it gets me up every day. Yeah, you know, mm. that's very cool. It's, it's just you would have thought it's solved in B two C. So in any moment you can go, Google a watch, Google a T shirt, you can Google a car, you can do all of mm. this in in a fraction of a fraction of a second. But goodness only knows what olive oil is, or sunflower oil in this case, is supposed to cost you in mm. Joburg as a restaurateur. Nobody knows. Mm. Mm. No. no, it's crazy. Mm. I love it. I absolutely love it. I think there's a yeah, real space. There's there. still opportunity. It's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's very yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very cool. And the okay. cool thing is it's not just here. It's global. So this is not a yeah, South I African see. problem. It's not a some monopsonistic South African problem. It's, an, it's a global problem. It's a, Everybody in the world has the same issue. Yeah, and I see mm. you've expanded to oh, Chicago, right. London. You guys mm. are abroad. Yeah, already. we're in a, Yeah, we, we're not uh, active in London. London is March twenty-five. It's the launch date for London. Um, 
we ran pilots in the U.S. So we had three pilots running in the U.S. for about a year and a half. I uh, learned a ton from those, a ton from those, and, and got really good improvements to our, to our go-to-market approach and strategy and costs. The U.S. was a very expensive place to, to launch and pilot. Um, and it really refined our thinking on, on how to do what we're doing cost-effectively. Um, yeah, and so what we did validate in those pilots is, is that the same problem exists and that the demand for a solution mm. exists. Yeah, so it's how we can most effectively and most capital efficiently um, approach those markets to, to provide solutions. That's, that's what we are almost done configuring. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So I'm really looking forward to awesome. 25. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Amazing. So shall we mm. wrap up there and now? Lightning round time? Yeah. Let's okay, go. Okay. So okay. Uh, if, if Rene best. didn't warn you, there is a lightning round. A couple he of questions. First thing that comes but to I mind. I do remember now from, from mm. other podcast episodes. So I should have somehow. <laughs> you should have <laughs> known for it. I should have <laughs> done my research. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, they're pretty standard. You'll be fine. I, I can tell. Okay, do your wish. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Let's yeah. go. Okay. So we always start yeah. with an easy one. Uh, mm. Sharing a book that you, that you recommend a uh, founder to read. Sure. Competing against luck, Clayton Christensen. So that's that jobs to be done framework. Absolutely. You know, that's the one book I think anybody should read is this idea that we have that, you know, Gates and all the people that were in the right place at the right time, they got quite lucky. But you think of what mm. we're all trying to do in the space of startup founders is we're trying to compete against people who are in the right place at the right time by luck. And so competing mm. against luck is a hundred percent. Yeah. Love it. Cool. Mm. Um, next question, your favorite or most uh, uh, useful go-to-market hack that you've done that worked well? Uh, go-to-market hack. So is, do you mean by that increasing sales or... Um, do we, How what, did you get you to market and, and increase distribution? Sure. I, f- I feel we're still busy with that. Can I defer that question to the next interview? I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. You know, we have an ambition to get to 50,000 active clients and uh, that one's quite far off, and um, um, I can tell you what didn't work. My not favorite okay. go-to-market, okay. Hack, which yeah. is um, in, in employing an extensive, direct boots on the ground sales force um, was far too expensive and inefficient. And so mm. I think my best answer there is I know what not to do. Not which to is do. To spend, <laughs> spend buckets that works. of money. That works. Getting here, give, paying human beings to run around when you could do significant portions of that um, mm. digitally. These days. Hard to track as well, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, so people that have got those kind of sales forces in in the in the field, sure. You know, they've got trackers on their cars and stuff like that to just mm. make sure that people do what they're supposed to be doing. But it's mm. it's ineffective. It's ineffective. It's inefficient. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. a lot of Especially times the it age, right? annoys customers. It annoys customers mm. as well. Exactly. And again, our, our client, he or she's very, very busy. They've got all of these fires, literally and figuratively. And to now have, I, I, w- I was in a, I was um, riding along with a salesperson in St. Louis, and and we went to go see, which is kind of cold, cold walk into one restaurant that he knew to see if he could introduce the product. And I'll never forget being in a queue behind four other salespeople that were trying to approach this room. There was a person from a beer oh company gosh. and someone from an apparel sure. business and or whatever. And this client, and it just struck me right then and there going, this is not the way to meet my mm-hmm. client's needs. You know, that person has got other stuff to do than deal with people um, mm-hmm. walking in their door. You know, and so that's yeah. that's my favorite don't go to hack. Yeah, I like it though. It's a mm. challenge out there. That's mm. why we ask. I like asking these kind of questions because mm. uh, mm. everyone's trying to figure it out. Um, yeah, we're trying to respect our clients now. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and can I ask? Can I ask you some questions? What are, besides saying what are your what are your thoughts? If you were me, um, what questions am I not asking that I should be asking, or what what would you do next if you were having listened to my whole story? What can I learn from you? To me, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm fascinated to understand the supply side of things. So mm. as a supplier, yeah. how do I, how do I get them to, to um, get involved, mm. make them part of the, the solution? Mm. That's, in that's kind of where my, my head is at the mm. moment. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, like that, to build that, that marketplace. Mm. Like I'm trying to understand mm. that. Mm. So, so that's where my head's 
mm. has gone in today's conversation. Mm. Yeah. No, no, get like get into the heads of the suppliers. Well, one of the reasons why we never launched that campaign about like supply by the seaside is is because it's antagonistic to the supply chain. And, and what we felt was we want to find ways to position ourselves in collaborative ways rather than that. So what mm-hmm. we're thinking is, is great, yeah. But there are ways to do that, but that'll be for like, our third, when we release our third product, I can tell you, I'll tell you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the next you're time you come on the pod and give us yeah. updates. Well, yeah. And you're in here, what would you do next? Or what question yes, am I not same. asking that I've, I should I've, be asking, I've, right? Sen, I've got a hundred ideas, but I know it would be really okay. bad to execute uh, execute on them because uh, I think for now, fo- focus <laughs> and scale any, is the important thing. Yeah. Focus and scale. Yeah, just just get the product better and get more restaurants to get more data points. And once you get, you, you'll know when you get to a point where it makes sense to add other products. Mm-hmm. Like so and then then I would be go to market. Yeah, just just get move, that. Move. Just go as far and wide and cement yourself in there. And then you know, once once you once you're entrenched, then then I'd mm-hmm. look at marketplace options as well. Like, let's mm-hmm. say someone flags, I'm unhappy mm-hmm. with this price. Okay, so you give it, you give mm-hmm. them a price, and they go, "Cool, I'm happy with the price mm-hmm. I got." Mm-hmm. And then you could press a button and go get a quote from our supplier network. And Correct, then you yeah. ping all the suppliers and go, "There's a guy in Stellenbosch that wants a quote mm-hmm. on Feta. What's mm-hmm. your best price?" Mm-hmm. And then everybody can ping in a price, and then you can match mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. So you know, and then you can also charge those guys a subscription fee. So I think that can yeah. make sense. Yeah. So I don't know why you, why you say that you got a hundred ideas not worth acting on because you've described something that's on our product roadmap. So yeah. 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 No, no. But I just I know yeah. if I, I know I get excited about things and not focus and not wait till the right time. So yeah, <laughs> I don't want to yeah, encourage yeah, other yeah. people to fall yeah. in the same trap. So, so so you would focus on the on the go to market and on and on. Mm. building out the, the kind of platforming potential rather than yeah. just the reporting potential. Yeah. Mm. Espe- especially while it's making money. Like you don't you don't need to mm. Mm. you don't need you're not in a rush to unlock more monetization. If you if you're making money now then mm-hmm. it's fun. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no yeah. it has a cool. positive DP gradient. So everything's good. Yeah. Yeah, we lost Bobby, but I'll wrap us up. Okay. So, thanks so much for joining us from Ed's yeah, up. Thank you for the chat, and yeah, I really appreciated it. I enjoyed chatting to you guys, and um, thank you to the listeners as well.